Hi, I'm Leslie Anderson. I'm the Director of Collections, Exhibitions, and Programs at the National Nordic Museum in Seattle. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Nordic Talks, Food Security and Sustainability, a series of four panels. During these talks, leading innovators and advocates for sustainable food practices and conservation discuss solutions to contemporary issues in the areas of fine dining, food packaging and processing, and agriculture. Leaders from the Nordic region and Washington state are participating in this series to increase awareness and inspire positive actions for a more secure and sustainable world. This is a third panel in the series. It's titled Preventing the Collapse of Colonies, Saving Bees and the Global Food Supply. This panel will move beyond discussions of food consumption and packaging and processing to address the first step in the cultivation of plant-based foods. Panelists here will discuss efforts to combat declining populations of the world's most important pollinator, bees. For this panel, the National Nordic Museum is grateful for the support of the Nordic Council of Ministers, and we have conducted this program in partnership with the Embassy of Norway in the United States. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the panel's moderator, Bob Redmond. With 14 years experience tending honeybees, at one time managing 150 colonies, Bob Redman has been a leader in pollinator conservation and habitat restoration. Founder of the nonprofit The Common Acre, which restores acres of pollinator habitat. He was also co-primary investigator on a four-year USDA project led by Washington State University and instigated the flight path and green line projects with SeaTac Airport and the Seattle City Light. Since 2009, Bob has operated the Urban Bee Company, newly dubbed Survivor Bee to reflect his focus on bee health. The Urban Bee Company manages apiaries and backyards, community gardens, and family farms. A master beekeeper candidate, former trustee of the Puget Sound Beekeepers Association, and past board president of Certified Naturally Grown, Redmond lives in South Seattle. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, Leslie. Um, so great to be here. I'm, I'm just grateful to be here with Maria and Melanie, and, and I want to introduce them, uh, our other panelists on this topic of preventing the collapse of colonies, saving bees, and the global food supply. Uh, we have Maria Schetzo. Did I say that well enough, Maria? Close enough. Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, She's from Norway. She has a master's of science within animal breeding and genetics. Uh, she's currently working on a PhD in the genomics, genom genomic selection field. She's worked mostly with farm animal species, but when starting work as a researcher at Norgen in August, 2020, she's been part of the organizing of the Nordic Brown Bee Network, which is a network of researchers and brown beekeepers in the Nordic region. She's currently part of a project group that is working on genomic characterization of the Norwegian brown bee population. Thank you for being here, Maria. Thank you uh, for having me. Of course. And we also have Melanie Kirby, beekeeper and Washington State University alumna, where she did research on queen breeding and the comparison behavior between Apis mellifera subspecies. She also founded Zia Queen Bees in 2005. She's been keeping bees for almost 25 years. And uh, Zia Queen Bee specializes in selection for longevity through collaborative exchange with beekeepers. Thank you for being here, Melanie. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. This has been such a fascinating uh, experience to prepare for this panel. And, and one of the things I learned was, well, how did, in this cool series, how did you come up with the talk of, um, of bees and also importantly, connecting it to the global food supply. And um, the story is that uh, a, a bunch of the producers had read this book by uh, Maya Lunda called The History of Bees. It's been a big international success. And um, it talks about, uh, there's three stories uh, from different beekeeping perspectives, past, present day, more or less, and then the future, and um, identifies the collapse of bees as kind of this um, apocalyptic event, and then agriculture behind it, and how do people respond to that. Um, and then also, uh, folks at the National Nordic Museum were talking with your organization, Melanie Nordgen, um, 
and about the important work of the specific, the bees specific to Nordic um, countries, the brown bees. So um, I, I thought we'd start there and um, talk specifically about the collapse of colonies identified in the book and then also in the title of this. Uh, here in the United States, it's been a phenomenon since about 2007. Um, in Europe, somewhat earlier, CCD has been sensationalized. I, uh, it's probably fair to characterize it that way in, in movie documentaries and then um, the plight of beekeepers such as David, David Hackenberg in Pennsylvania who lost massive amounts of colonies. So um, to Maria and Melanie, are, are the bees collapsing and uh, honeybees? And if they aren't, is something else collapsing? What's, what's, is there a crisis moment happening right now? I have to admit, uh, I'm not a beekeeper, so I, I don't have the, the information. My, my information is more on the, the conservation side. Um, in Norway, it hasn't been that much uh, talk about this uh, colony collapse disorder. This, of course, has been an issue. Um, we did have, uh, for the brown bees specifically, uh, some uh, foul brood uh, diseases in the um, uh, 2010. Uh, that was very threatening to the brown bee population, uh, where they had to um, burn a lot of cubes. Uh, so that was, um, uh, and definitely uh, there is a threat to honeybees in general that, um, yeah, they are. Uh, um, uh, yeah, with diseases and, uh, and things like that. Um, I know, Melanie, do you have anything to add with the, in the in America? What, how, how are things there? Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, and just to sort of reiterate what Bob had mentioned, you know, yeah, about 2006, 2007 was when CCD sort of hit the news and there was, um, you know, a lot of of media presence in terms of of sharing this this situation, um, and it was interesting because I think a lot of entomologists and apiculturists or or bee bee researchers in particular, you know, had been um, applying for funding here and there. A lot of them are in competition with each other, but because of that um, crisis then a lot more funding came. And so you saw a lot of bee labs really able to, um, to sort of revive and, and reinvigorate, I should say, um, in terms of their efforts. And it also sort of lessened the competition to a certain degree because everybody was banding together to try and figure out what's going on. Um, and so in a sense, it really brought, you know, um, within the academic arena, it brought that community together. And then as time has gone on, we've seen that, you know, it's not any one facet of the industry at large or stakeholders that are going to be able to solve the issue. You know, it really became apparent that it was to really necessitate deeper relationships um, between a multitude and a diversity of sectors. So you have the researchers who are partnering with organizations, who are also partnering with beekeepers, who are partnering with communities. And so you see this, um, this sort of massive development of what, you know, what we can call cross-pollination, so to speak, um, in trying to figure out what's going on. And interestingly, you know, within my experience, I, I, I've had the blessed opportunities to work for um, several commercial places. I have my own small bee farm as well. And then most recently I finished my master's as, um, in entomology from Washington State University. And so I've, I've had the opportunity to sort of become more familiar with these various sectors within the larger American apicultural industry. And I, I, I describe it to people as, you know, these are exciting yet frightening times, right? I mean, but nothing like, um, you know, banding together for a common cause to really promote innovation, right? Necessity is the mother of, of invention. And so we're seeing a lot of uh, various applications. I mean, everything from ag tech and AI to even just novel devices and handheld, you know, um, programs that people can use from their phone to help track and to help monitor um, and all these various organizations that are now trying to, to um, 
handle that data and to be able to make sense of it. So interestingly, I mean, I have a friend actually who's a, a beekeeper in Florida and he's a migratory beekeeper between Florida and New York. And, and he likes to joke, you know, that it's, it's not colony collapse disorder, it's beekeeper collapse disorder that, you know, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of these older beekeepers who have been around for such a long time, who have a wealth of information, um, are starting to either retire when they're not, this, they, maybe they don't have anybody to pass the business on to, or, um, or they're being sort of, you know, closing out the business because of these increasing, you know, pests and diseases, um, and other factors that are, that seem to be escalating. And so interestingly, while those older sort of commercial folks are, our numbers are, are going down, we actually have been seeing a huge influx of um, what we call urban or hobbyist beekeepers um, who are non-migratory, right? Who are setting up a couple of hives, say in their backyard, maybe they live in the city or right outside the city. And so even in my, um, my home state of New Mexico, um, which these are Trucha's Peaks right behind me. That's actually where my bee farm is up near there. Um, there's been um, a huge amount of, of urban beekeepers um, and, and thousands of them, thousands upon thousands of them. And on the one hand, while that's a, well, that's a good thing or it can be a good thing, it's also posing some other challenges because we have um, oversaturation in particular pockets and in areas where forage might be limited or compromised. Um, and not to mention the fact that we also have, you know, 19,000 other, you know, kinds of, of, uh, of bee species globally. And in fact, I did my math wrong. If there's 20,000 bee species globally that we know of, then there's 19,999 of them that aren't necessarily Apis mellifera, right? Um, and so we're, we're seeing those impacts now too, because if we oversaturate with just one species, that's going to have an effect on all these other very um, important uh, solitary and new social species of bees as well. Thanks, Melanie. That's a, a good segue to a question for you, Maria. Um, speaking of, of uh, the subspecies of honeybees, can you talk about the Nordic brown bee and, and how that is uh, distinguished among honeybees and also your work with Norgen to kind of um, preserve that subspecies. Yeah, uh, so the brown bee is considered an ecotype or a subspecies of the old European bee. Uh, the exact origin is unknown, but it developed separate from the other honeybees between half a million and a million years ago. Uh, and it spread widespread from the Ural Mountains in the east to Ireland in the west, and from Spain in the south to Norway in the north. And uh, they have discovered cave paintings in south of France that are between 6,000 and 22,000 years old that show people climbing trees uh, with uh, ropes uh, up to a chiseled hole with uh, wild honeybees swarming around. Uh, so before the 19th century, the bees were in hollow trees in the forest. Um, and uh, humans have uh, used honeybees for, for centuries. And then from the 19th century, then modern beekeeping became a thing and uh, um, they developed these um, wooden hive boxes uh, and they, that made the bees, the colonies movable from uh, origins to origins. So uh, in areas where the brown bee has been native in the Northern Europe, uh, then um, it's endangered because the other subspecies were more popular. Uh, and then we can ask ourselves if that is a problem. Uh, what if those bees are better at producing honey? Are they better at producing or pollinating? Um, are they nicer to the beekeepers? Like, why do we care about this uh, subspecies? And um, I would argue that we do have a problem because we have reason to believe like we're losing the brown bee, we actually lose populations of bees that have unique combinations of traits that are adapted to specific local environments. Uh, and we are losing a great amount of genetic diversity that might be valuable, for example, when trying to breed for disease resistance or when bees will, ha be when bees <laughs> will be having to adapt to uh, new environmental challenges 
caused by climate change. Uh, saying that animal populations are locally adapted is quite trendy. Uh, you can say it about a lot of local breeds. Uh, but for the bees, there are more studies that show that this is actually true. And uh, there have been studies, for example, uh, moving uh, Ligustica breeds from northern Italy to southern Italy and vice versa. And they show that the hives did uh, best in the region of origin. Uh, and we also have this experience in Norway, for example, moving bees from the west coast to the uh, from the east coast to the west coast, where the west coast, the weather is more harsh. Uh, and we have also found genomic signatures of local adaptation. And uh, the work we are doing in Norgen is that we have this uh, Nordic brown bee network. Um, and we uh, host meetings yearly um, with uh, beekeepers and researchers to kind of connect them in the work to um, uh, to uh, do conservation work and uh, promote the brown bee. Uh, but we have a, a plan of action for conservation uh, and it lists um, a background and it has a, rec a priority list uh, of recommended action, um, which goes into um, networking, breeding, recruitment to recruit new beekeepers, uh, research, uh, characterization, like we do now in Norway, we are collecting uh, bee samples to um, uh, to uh, be able to determine the pureness of the bees that are held in Norway, for example, because they have found a lot of crossbreeding. Um, and they're also looking at marketing. Uh, we have developed this um, uh, branding. I'm not sure if you can yeah, hear this uh, dark bee. Uh, with the story of the dark bee. Uh, it's called both brown bee and the dark bee. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, a beekeeper can use with their honey when they sell it to kind of promote uh, the brown bee. Can you excuse me, Maria, is there a, a website link or something that you can um, say where people can find uh, more information that you're showing right now? Uh, it's on the Nurgen webpage. Uh, we have a link to both the action plan and um, the and they can contact us also if they want the brand uh, the brand work. Okay. Yeah. And um... we also have a wiki page, Brown Bee Wiki, uh, where they you can find information about uh, specific uh, how to keep brown bees because it's a little bit different than keeping the the commercial honeybees. And um, so that there is some specific differences that if Absolutely. you are a beekeeper that you should know uh, the differences. And that's available at uh, www.nordgen.org, N-O-R-D-G-E-N.org. Yeah. So just to, I wanna offer some additional historical context. You know this, uh, but, and you identified the, um, Kind of the movable frame hive, the wooden hive uh, in the 19th century that became popular. But even uh, for 4500 BC, the Egyptians were floating clay hives up and down the Nile, the first migratory beekeeping. And um, as soon as, and then of course there are the straw skeps later and even in the 16th century. And humans have just been on a pace of acceleration ever since the end of the ice age in terms of moving, um, growing plants, and uh, especially accelerating past World War II or um, the, the way that we took migratory beekeeping to a whole at a level loading flatbeds full of hives and moving them around this country. Um, there's just been a, a super accelerating pace from as soon as, as, soon as humans could manage it to um, cross space and, and time and, and propagate things. But then at the same time, kind of the, the ecological way of survival is to develop diversity and move slowly and create small communities uh, that are very interrelated. And I, I'm interested to know, especially since you two are um, focused on, on breeding and Melanie, you've even talked about breeding queens in the um, language of seeds, so that you're finding this connection uh, between 
cultivating bees or, or um, selecting bees and then selecting agriculture. And how do you reconcile the forces of humanity, which are tend towards globalizing, right? And then the forces of healthy ecosystems, which depend on, on diversity and, and um, small interrelationships. How do you reconcile those uh, from our point of view? What can we um, do to balance that? Those are, those are um, great concepts that we could talk hours upon hours about for sure. And um, yeah, I just wanna, um, you know, applaud Maria's work because I'm a big fan of ecotypes. And I think that we don't give them enough credit. You know, um, we tend to just lump honeybees all in one, all in one sort of lump, right? Or, or, or mix. And especially for us, those, you know, who are located stateside, right? Because in Europe and Africa and even Asia, you have these, um, these really distinct ecotypes. And in fact, you know, when they look at, you know, the origin of, of honeybees and the, even some of the migration theories, you know, they, as they started to move across the landscape and then there'd be, you know, separations by bodies of water or canyons or mountains or various topographical influences that really isolated certain populations, then these ecotypes really had a chance to develop and adapt in tandem with their specific environment, right? And so that's how they became their own strain. And so within the honeybee um, species, you know, that we know of, there's close to 30 subspecies or ecotypes, right? And there's probably even more because as we find these various isolated pockets or um, communities of bees where they've really had a chance to, to develop their local adaptation, they're going to have these genomic differences. And I'm, I'm very fascinated with that. Um, and it's also you know, a real play between not only the genetics of the bees, but then how that environment really shapes their behavior and the plasticity or the genetic plasticity. And, and in, in tandem, that's basically what we call the epigenetics, right? It's, it's the fact that there's genes being turned on and off depending on what the bees are experiencing or, or being impacted by environmentally, whether it's weather or particular flows of um, nectar flows by particular plants, et cetera. But when you look at the states, um, you know, we have a huge um, sort of melting pot of bees, just like our peoples, right? Um, yet I myself, how do I reconcile this? I'm, I'm of, you know, indigenous um, descent. I was born and raised here in New Mexico, which is my home area. Um, and we have over 19 sovereign nations. So if I wanted to make an analogy and say, you know, well, we're all these humans here of varying um, uh, heritage that live here in the U.S., but within this particular community, we have 19 sovereign communities that are very distinct, right? And they're on a mission to preserve their culture and to preserve their heritage. So if we look at this with, um, in regards to bees, it can be very analogous in that way in that we have, you know, um, various populations that we can try and really um, support so that they, they remain distinct. There's still always gonna be some mixing here or there, but here stateside, just to kind of get to back to bees at hand, you know, stateside, we, um, you know, we tend to think of honeybees as exotics, that they were brought in by settlers, right? We actually do have an American honeybee um, fossil um, that dates 14 million years old and was found in Nevada. Um, and so just like horses, they actually used to be on this continent, on the North American continent. And then there was an ice age or you know, a, a basically a climatic event and they disappeared. And so then they were reintroduced by people who came over. So I like to consider honeybees and horses as being reintroduced species to this continent. That being the case though, what was brought over was not the same as what was here, right? So Apis mellifera nearctica, which is the American honeybee fossil that we have, um, we don't have that here anymore, but we have cousins to that ancestor, right? So we have Apis mellifera lagustica, which are also known as Italian bees that have been brought over, Apis mellifera caucasica, carnica, um, you know, over the years, starting in the 1600s, you know, lots of different bees were brought over. And in fact, um, 
it was, it was an arduous trip, but then as bees started to adapt here and started to proliferate, then um, people quit bringing them because it's a very stressful trip to bring them all the way across the Atlantic, right? Um, and then steamships were invented. And so then we had a new influx. We had bees coming in from Egypt and from even farther away places to North America because now they could make that journey a little bit easier. And then in the 20s, the Isle of Wight disease hit, which is tracheal mites, and that was, um, uh, you know, off of the UK. And so they, they shut the borders. And so to this day, this law still exists on the books. You, you're not allowed to bring in honeybees, at least live honeybees to, um, to the United States. So in the meantime, what has happened, right? So now we've had bees that have um, spread because also, you know, settler expansion as people moved westward, you know, um, and then we also have the industrialization of agriculture and, and big ag really taking root here. And then we have, you know, very few operations producing a lot of queens. So even for us here stateside, the genetic diversity of our melting pot bees that we have is slowly narrowing. Our genetic diversity is narrowing within our honeybees. And so we're seeing that in tandem, you know, with um, compromised uh, forage, um, whether that's due to pesticides or um, systemic uh, applications of, you know, seed coating and also, um, you know, potential impacts from genetically modified um, foods. We also have loss of habitat just due to, you know, the, the bigger cities that are evolving. Um, and we have shifting climate that's now affecting everything. So you, you kind of put this all in this cocktail soup um, and it's kind of a whammy after whammy that's hitting our bees, right? And so there, there is, there's that concern as to, okay, how do we, how do we promote which bees are surviving? Which by the way, I love your hat, Bob. I think it's great, <laughs> a survivor bee. Um, and there's people like myself, you know, I'm not the only one, but it's a growing movement. And when I first started getting into bee breeding back in, 2000, it was right around the year 2000 when I started learning about queen rearing, but it wasn't until about 2005 that I really started immersing myself in the actual selective process of breeding. Um, you know, it was, there was just a few of us that, that, you know, I could think of five of us, that was it. Now there's a growing movement and there's more people from coast to coast who are trying to work on building their local populations. And so in the U.S., it's almost like we started with the mix, like a big soup of stuff. And now we're tr there are efforts to try and find locally adapted strains within that big soup mix, right? Whereas when you go to Europe and Asia and Africa, they started with their individual ecotypes, right? And now they're starting to, you know, some places they're starting to mix. And so there's these efforts to try and preserve what they have so it doesn't get lost in the mix. So it's really interesting. It's almost like a positive and negative um, image, right? Of the same, but just one's inverse than the other. And um, I think it, it really kind of goes to show, you know, your bigger question of, yeah, how do we reconcile this? Um, I, I, for one, do recognize, especially here stateside, because we're such a big country, um, you know, not every state is the same. There's not the same forage. The soil's different. You know, some are really low elevation. I'm in the Southern Rocky Mountains. I'm in New Mexico, which actually is predominantly high desert, but our lowest elevational point is um, 2,900 feet. And then our peaks rise up to close to a little over 13,000. So my, my farm is actually at 8,300 foot elevation, which is 2,500 meters, right? That's very different than if you're in California and you're right at sea level, totally different landscape, totally different forage, and really totally different kind of bee that's going to do well there. So and I'll, I'll, I want to give Maria a turn, but I want to um, address something that she mentioned because I thought it was, it was really great. You mentioned that some of the research that had been done looking at these um, ecotypes, and you're right, there's some really good research that came out in 2014. I believe Ibra published um, one of them um, from the Buchler lab and uh, looking at these local ecotypes and then um, seeing how they have local adaptations. And then a second research paper that came out that same year where they actually, um, and this was with various members from COLOS, which is an international consortium of scientists who volunteer their time to work on, 
on how to prevent colony losses. Um, and they did a did a research project where they they shared queens. So you know, um, folks in Italy shared queens with people in France and Germany and and Austria and a few different places. They all swapped queens with each other and they monitored them um, over that year or that I think maybe even two years. And what they found was that yes, the bees that did the best in Italy were the Italian bees. <laughs> the other bees did okay, but they didn't outperform the local strain. And so that just reiterates the importance of these ecotypes. And so trying to find them can be, especially for someone like myself who's stateside, that can be like trying to find a needle in the haystack, right? Like, how can we find that? But there are efforts. And I think that um, there's, there's a way for both to coexist. That's the reconciliation is that there's a way to have some, um, what we call cross stocks that are that are diversified in their own mix, but then there's also um, the 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 need and I think the the responsibility to also keep these what I want to consider as heritage strains or heritage seeds alive, right? Thanks, Melody. Maria, how how is it working out for you and the brown bee? Do you see hope for the survival of the brown bee, or do you feel like it's just a matter of time before things all become part of the same soup. I think it's a hope. And um, over the last 10 years, there's been an uh, increase in the number of brown bee. And we see a lot of public interest in, maybe they don't really necessarily know about brown bees specifically, but people are in general interested in pollinators and in insects and in general, in conservation work. And I think that's maybe part of this crisis that were made by the colony uh, collapse disorder, that people actually gained awareness uh, that we have to care about the pollinators. Um, and we have an increase in people who want, we have the, uh, some places waitlisted to get new queens. Um, and uh, yeah, so the brown bee is expanding. Uh, one, um, challenge with uh, keeping the with the conservation and keeping them pure is that the uh, the drone bees they will travel up to 20 kilometers to mate with another queen uh, so we have uh, what we call pure breed areas uh, mm -hmm. where it's by law especially in Norway we have two areas that are by law only allowed to keep brown bees and we also have some private areas where the brown bee association have agreed within themselves or the beekeepers that this area is only for brown bees. Uh, so that's one way of keeping them, uh, conserving them and knowing that in this area there are pure brown bees. And we also have in Denmark, they have this island, Lasse, uh, which also have uh, brown bees. And in Åland, in... No, wait, that's not pure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there are different areas. Um, that are um, set aside just to keep brown bees and to make sure that they are conserved pure and uh, they will sell or produce queens in these areas that they can then uh, sell to beekeepers in other areas. Uh, so that's one way of conserving, yeah. Thank you. you. You raise an interesting point about human nature. On one hand, humans will travel, they'll move their whole family to France or uh, from one side of the United States to the other, um, acclimate. But then at the same time, we really do value um, our roots or like where the little village that my family came from in Italy or um, buying local, buying something that's just from this region. And, and maybe once people understand the value, say of the Nordic brown bee or you know the true Italian bee, or what is then they they respond to that. So here I want to shift gears a little bit, and also um, pay respect to Norse culture, and and talk about story. Uh, Norse culture has a great history of story, and some would argue the original history of story because um, of the Icelandic writer Snorri Sturluson from the 13th century who um, collected the Eddas and and um, basically codified Norse mythology for the ages, um, all the way to Lars Gustafsson, who wrote my favorite bee book, The Death of a Beekeeper um, in the 1970s, he's from Sweden, to the book by Maya Lundi that I mentioned, The History of Bees, um, 
a great tradition of, of storytellers. Can you talk about, um, and I know you're both scientists, but you also appreciate uh, communicating with people and kind of getting uh, people to respond to the stories that we tell and possibly change their behavior. Can you talk about the stories we tell about bees and the future of agriculture? Do these stories matter? Um, or how do we make them matter and, and connect people in a way that they will say, aha, and maybe change their behavior? Melanie, I'm gonna to toss this to you because um, I, I heard some awesome threads of stories. You were kind of detailing history there. And um, anyway, interested from, to hear both of you, but let's start with Melanie. Sure. Um... Yeah, I mean, storytelling is extremely important. Science telling is also extremely important. And when we, even when we look at just the science of things um, without context or without connecting it to uh, an emotion, it can tend to just sort of, you know, fall on deaf ears, so to speak, right? We have to make it meaningful in some way. And um, more recently I spent, uh, Right prior to the pandemic, I was um, living in Spain, actually working on um, some bee research there as a, as a Fulbright National Geographic Fellow. And part of my project there was to collect those stories from Spanish beekeepers. Um, and Maria had mentioned the cave. And so, yeah, there's the, the man of bee corps or what's called the, the Cueva de las Arañas, which is where there's this cave painting of, you know, the oldest cave painting we know of, of, of a honey hunter. And the Spanish beekeepers, what I found was that they were very, very proud of their heritage bee, right? And they, that's all they wanted to use. And so um, they, they really, at least the beekeepers I interacted with, which were predominantly in Andalusia in the Southern part of the, of the country, um, took a lot of pride in their, in their native bee and in wanting to preserve their native bee, right? Um, and they also took a lot of pride in the way in the history of beekeeping in Spain, which fascinated me because as, as a country that, you know, honeybees are endemic to there, there's a huge rich uh, folklore and just even cultural and traditional practices revolving around beekeeping. And in the States, we, we have, you know, we have these developing, we're a younger country, right? And so the histories of our beekeeping are, are still forming, so to speak. Um, and I found that it's by tapping into those stories that we will create that poignancy that that will become um, attractive for people to want to listen to, you know, coming from um, also as an indigenous person, but I, I walk in multiple worlds, you know, I'm, I'm a product of the melting pot, you know, um, but I'm also my ancestors are from this, this land in this country, um, as well. And so by walking in two worlds, I recognize that, you know, there's what we call TEK or traditional ecological knowledge and technologies. And um, they're very true. They're, they're, they're distinct by culture, right? But they're, they're very true and they're passed on through oral storytelling or they're passed on through um, uh, magical realism and relaying stories of, of legends and things that, that help to explain um, not only the natural world, but also interactions, human interactions, and, and how we deal with, with um, various emotions that we have. And I find that sometimes science can be um, really clinical, at least Western science. And one of the things that my advisor, Dr. Shepard, shared with me, and, and he actually travels the world to bring, to bring semen, actually, of these old world ecotype strains that are, that do have more genetic diversity than American bees, so that then he can help to share them with American beekeepers. Um, to help prevent pests and diseases. But one of the things he shared with me about scientific writing was he said, you know, well, there's only so much space when you go to publish, there's only so much room for it. And while there is something very sort of nice and tidy about very concise writing, um, if you don't draw people in with um, illusory um, verbiage, you know, or adjectives, um, then it's, again, it's going to fall on deaf ears. So even our science is going to fall short if we can't really be able to share it with the broader public. So I think storytelling is extremely important. And I've, I've 
been more on a mission now since I finished my degree to really try and, you know, um, couple those things together, you know, and taking the traditional ecological knowledge and also pairing it with Western sustainable ag science to, so that they're complementing each other. And then how do we move forward in, in communicating about it? Well, it's going to take a little bit of poetry as well. Thanks, Melanie. Maria, I'd love to hear what you have to say about story, Norse tradition, if you have any, any thoughts about that. And, and then also getting changing people's behavior um, and getting them engaged in um, kind of a new vision about agriculture and, and bees. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I have like Norse storytelling. I don't think we, it's the same as in the Viking age anymore. Um, but I do have a, maybe like a fun story uh, um, from the Viking times, uh, bees were not only used for honey, but uh, it is said that the uh, inhabitants of Chester used bees to defend the city by throwing their beehives at the Vikings, and then they withdrew quickly, according to ancient Irish manuscripts. So bees are useful for many things. <laughs> um, um, and back to your question about storytelling and getting informa information out is one of the hardest things these days. With uh, There is so much information coming in from everywhere, social media and news and yeah, getting new information out and scientific information out is so hard because it's so hard for people to know what is true, what is false. Um, yeah, it's a really important task. Uh, and um, yeah, I think you're right, Melanie, that we have to use some poetry and we have to to make it um, uh, something that they want to listen to. Uh, yeah. Right. And I think, you know, Bob, you mentioned it too, you know, there's people are are wanting, they're craving that local aspect. You know, we, we're, we're very globalized you know, society in general, humankind has become, you know, but um, down at its core, we all think fondly, or most of us tend to think really fondly of home, you know, what is home? Where, where is that core? And when we live in a particular place um, and we become more nuanced in not only the landscape, but, you know, the seasons as they pass through there, the, the, um, chronological timing of various events, you know, things that happen yearly or every so often, we look forward to those things, right? And they become a part of this larger story for that community, right? And so I think there's science, science is definitely a part of that. Um, and I think it's because we've been on the, you know, I'm talking human, humanity has been on such an accelerated push, as Bob has mentioned, you know, just things have accelerated so quickly. Um, you know, that's sort of the macrocosm of things. But when we come down to the microcosm, it's, it's still very slow. You know, people are still getting up every day. The bees are still buzzing. They're still waiting for the flowers to open, which are, are waiting for the rains, you know, and all of that is, is still relying on the tilt and the and the revolutions of the earth, you know, of our planet on its axis, right? And um, and even in our frenzied state of going to and fro, I mean, all of these, uh, there's this whole, you know, microscopic universe that's occurring, you know, as well at the same time at its own pace, you know, even quantumly, right? <laughs> and so I think it's, as I mentioned before, it's kind of um, exciting yet frightening times, you know, for us to be in this industry where there's, there's concern, there's alarm, we, you know, sh changing climate is now a really, you know, it's, it's something we can't ignore anymore. And so when we think about the global food supply, or we think about, you know, how do we um, preserve biodiversity, it's definitely going to take everybody, it's going to take um, the scientists, it's going to take the beekeepers, the ecologists, the farmers, the teachers, you know, and the storytellers to really sort of help maintain awareness, but then to also create calls to action. You know, what can people do to help? You are, you're leading me right into kind of a, a summary uh, question we're going to end with, obviously, what are we going to do? 
but um, <laughs> I want to stay on the macro for a minute because, um, well, I'll just say this as a personal uh, context. I've, I've been keeping bees for 15 years and I feel like um, somebody asked me yesterday, well, oh yeah, you must be an expert. And I'm like, actually, I think I don't, I'm just feeling like I, I could be a beginner. Like I'm, every every one of those years, I get to try a couple things, right? And um, I have to wait a whole year before the next spring comes around and then I can say, oh, I'm gonna do this different. And um, so I think, you know, finally I've, I've gotten enough where I, I think I know the right questions to ask. Um, but the, the neat thing about it is that I'm on that scale that you talked about, Melanie, of, of nature, where it's cyclical and seasonal and it revolves around the sun. And that is inviolable. Like that is the pace of things in reality. I mean, in, in true heart reality. Um, and, and both of you doing genetic research, like other than the lab work, like you're still dependent on these seasons to see results in the field, um, to make adjustments. And so do you feel as, and I know you're much more than scientists, but especially when you're tied to that um, kind of um, natural and, geo and geological time, um, does, it, does it feel frustrating or do you feel alarmed that meanwhile, there's this freight train of, of globalization uh, and technology that can send a pandemic around the entire globe in six months, uh, do you feel like you can you can really compete with that in terms of solving some of the problems that you're trying to solve? How do you uh, how do you kind of continue going with hope in the face of that pace of uh, you know potential disruption? How do you do it, Ma Maria? Um. Okay, yeah, there's no option not to just keep going, I guess. Um, but um, I think especially when it comes to uh, pollinators that there is a public awareness now that we need to, to help the, to be, save the bees. Uh, people know about it, people have heard about it. And I've been talking to people that don't really have any interest in agriculture or things like that, but they know about it and they, might do it. and it's small things that they actually can do something about uh, if they have a garden that they know that oh we should keep some wildflowers available or people actually go and buy plants that are um, good for pollinators and uh, ask about it at their local garden place and you can buy these little insect hotels or there are recipes how to make them yourselves and I think, as, especially here in Norway, that's a big thing. Like people care about the pollinators, and 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 people put pressure on maybe farmers to to leave some land on the side of the field uh, uh, with for flowers for the pollinators. And there is actually a work going there. And I think it's easier for people to to do something than for the climate change. Actually, that there are easier things for one person that you can help. You can buy this insect hotel and have it outside your house. And uh, instead of the climate change is a, uh, <laughs> is a bigger problem and it's harder for one, pe one person to do something about it or feel like they can help. But I think actually with pollinators, um, pe we have managed uh, to, to reach people and they, they feel like they can help. Uh, so that's one thing that's positive, I think. Uh, about this work. Um, yeah, and you're you're saying that people understand bees are in trouble and save the bees is certainly a, a movement. Do you think that people understand the connections between bees and the food that's uh, on their plates or that they want to eat? I think to I don't think maybe the full extent of the meaning, but people know that the, the food supply is dependent on insects and pollinators to some extent. Uh, and people have tried to kind of um, catastrophize it so that they can understand that, okay, 40% of the food in the store would be completely gone if you don't have any, I, I'm not sure if that's correct, but um, 
uh, but I don't think people really realize how bad it would be if we really mm. lost uh, the insects or the pollinators. That's kind of a big thing to take in on yourself. Um, but to some extent, I do think that they know that there is a connection there. So how would, especially for people listening, how would you help them make the connection um, and you too, Melanie, between bees and agriculture and food supply? Um, how, how would you help them understand that? Well, I think it's definitely um, a moment of reckoning, right? <laughs> that, that people need to have where they start to really where the impact of it really hits home. Um, and globalization kind of counters that a little bit, you know, especially, um, you know, because we, we can get cherries in the off season, they're coming from the different, you know, the opposite hemisphere, right? And so we tend to think, oh, well, these things are never ending, they're, they're a given, we'll get them. But, but when we really look at the seasonality of things, um, I think that's when it really hits. And as people do get that craving for more local, um, uh, foods and local stories, you know, that produce those foods, we're going to see that shift. Um, I wanted to mention a couple things just to, to compliment what Maria had been saying, you know, um, when you're a single person, you know, looking at this larger, you know, immense crisis of, you know, not only globalization, but also the, the issues that come with it, right? Because there are some benefits to it, um, but there are also some, some major challenges. Um, and as we see shifting climate, you know, how can we, what, what can we do? And I think it really comes down to reciprocity. Um, you know, knowing that you are of a place, even if you're just there for, oh, I'm only here while I'm in college or, oh, I'm only here for this, you know, contract work or whatever. There's so many little things that people could do um, in whatever community they happen to be in, whether they're a visitor or whether they're a long-term resident. Um, and I mean, that some of that can be just volunteering. Some of it can just be even picking up trash, but a lot of it is just rooted in reciprocity in recognizing that we are a part of this landscape. We are a part of nature. Um, and in, and in the, the language of you know, indigenous peoples, which I cannot speak for all of them, but there's, there's similarities that unite um, a lot of indigenous folks is that um, we're all interconnected. So, you know, from the water to the air, to the soil, to um, the trees, to the birds, to our pollinator relatives, we are all relatives. Um, and so we really look at it through that lens of, you know, I'm a part of this space and to go in sort of blindly and just do what you want to do without thinking about how that's impacting your other relatives, whether that's the land or the water or the trees or these other um, pollinators, you know, that's, that's where the disconnect is. So how do we make that connection? And I think a lot of it is, is um, just slowing down. So there's a, there's a group that I've started to become involved with um, that's um, affiliated with Slow Food International, but they actually have a Slow Bees um, network that they've started. And it's really trying to look more closely at, you know, yeah, how do we um, really nurture our local populations and the local um, products and artis you know, artisanal foods that can be produced from our, from our local populations, whether that's, you know, in, in the case of, bee, of slow bees, it's with bees, but there's also slow fish, slow seeds, slow meat, you know, it's all, and slow meaning as opposed to say fast food, right? So it's slow food. <laughs> I think, um... We're, we're going to wrap up soon, and I want to give even more space. And thank you for what you said, Melanie. It's so crucial to understand that um, there's a crisis, but it's not. And if I'm hearing, if I'm hearing you right, you're saying that it's not about you know save the bees and let's you know punch that button and and fix, check that off. You know, it's more. It's deeper. And it's, it's a bigger crisis, but it's also a more fundamental shift of how to um, change our relationship with ecology, especially here in, in West, where Western, in the America, in the United States, where the culture is so dominant. Um, I can't speak for other places in 
the world, but um, it can be very destructive to be so selfish. Um, and we need to change that. And, and Maria, I hear you saying similar things that, uh, you know, people need to make some connections between the food that they eat and the bees that they care about. And so my question to you when I say, well, what should we do is sure, what do we do to help bees? Um, planting flowers and some people will be drawn to beekeeping, but may, that might you know, not be the thing that's gonna save them, right? Especially the honeybees and uh, maybe learn about the other kinds of bees and how to support them. So t say um, some few things that you advise people to do, not only for the bees specifically, but to change this relationship between ourselves and ecology um, and kind of get beyond that immediate laundry list of, you know, how to fix how to fix the little thing. So what would you recommend for people um, kind of as next steps that they can they can take uh, as they're headed out of this conversation? I think in general, just to care about where your food comes from, check um, buy from local farmers. Uh, because often it's the small farmers, they maybe have more room for pollinators in the field um, uh, in uh, contradiction to this huge industry farms where you just have miles and miles of fields with no room for pollinators. Uh, so care about where your food comes from, care about everything you buy, where does it come from? Because um, to buy locally means that you support your your local environment, but it also actually means that you support the global environment uh, by reducing transportation um, and uh, yeah, uh, reducing uh, factory industry that is can be harmful to the environment in general. So actually by, by caring about the environment in general, you also care about uh, the pollinators and the ecology. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Care care about where you get things from, what you buy, where you, your your money is actually a vote. You vote with your money, where, how things are produced and how the world goes around. Uh, because a lot of times, money decides uh, too much, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Thank you, Melanie. Yeah, very true, Maria. Um, you know, money is a tool like other things, but it sometimes ends up becoming the sole goal and um, and that becomes tunnel vision, right? And then, you know, there's, there's actually a proverb, a Cree proverb that says, you know, when the last tree has been cut down and the water is poisoned and there's no more fish, only then will you realize that you cannot eat money. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, while it is a tool, we also need to realize that it, it isn't the end goal. You know, a lot of, a lot of the important things that happen in life are the process, right? Not so, um, and I'm a big fan of flower power. So I always like to tell people, you know, what's something you can do. You can plant more flowers because not only are they gorgeous, but they help to feed so many um, different uh, insects and, and pollinators for sure. Um, and it really does start from the ground up, you know, with our soil and our soil health too. And so I think as, you know, if we plant flowers and we see that they're not growing, then maybe it'll, it'll encourage us to to go on this sort of path of discovery and go, oh, wow, maybe now I need to learn about soil or maybe now I need to learn about this or that. And, and I feel like that's what pollinators have really been for me. That's what beekeeping has really been for me. They've really um, not only served as the sentinels but have really opened the gateway to the broader world of biodiversity. And I just feel, um, you know, super blessed to be on this on this planet with, all, with everybody else here and, and that life is a gift and we should cherish it. Thank you, Melanie. Is there anything um, either of you want to add before we wrap up um, completely? Um, oh, I, there's one thing I did want to yeah, mention. So yeah. one of my, I call her my muse, but she's one of my biggest um, 
um, I would say uh, mentors, and also she's been very encouraging to me, is a Finnish American um, a journalist named Mia McNeil Draper. And she writes a lot for the American Bee Journal. And so uh, when we were talking about storytelling, her her name popped in my mind. I was like, I should really mention Mia because she's she's the one who encouraged excuse me, encouraged me to start writing um, about my beekeeping and, and uh, my, bee my larger philosophy, I guess. And so um, for those who are interested, she's, she's got a website too, M-E-A and then McNeil Draper. And she's, um, she's a Finnish American journalist. Excellent. Thank you. Closing comments, Maria? I um, just want to say thank you for uh, for having me. It's been really interesting to to talk to you. And, yeah. Thank yeah. Thanks you. so much. This has been great. Nice Absolutely. to meet you, Maria. <laughs> nice to meet you too, Melanie. I want to come check out the brown bees. Yeah, you should. <laughs> and that I want to cool. come check out those mountains. They look really nice. <laughs> you should. You should. Yeah, there's actually a population, um, an isolated population of bees that I've been um, monitoring for about almost 15 years now. And I'm looking for somebody to come help with the, with the genomics. So maybe we can, um, maybe we can collaborate and can come on out and, and help us learn more about our, our bees out here. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Thank you both. Um, my little, uh, recommendation, which I should mention, because I've been thinking about it all through this panel is, uh, it's not a new book, but it's an essential book by Robin Wall Kimmerer called Braiding Sweetgrass. Mm -hmm. So um, for those of you who are interested in some of the things we talked about today, that might be a good um, thing for you to check out. Um, so again, Melanie Kirby, thank you so much for being here. Maria Chetso, uh, yeah. from Norway. Oh, and Melanie's, you know, participating from New Mexico and Maria from Norway. Uh, I'm in Seattle and it's just been great to be here virtually with both of you. Thank you not only for your time today, but all, all the work that you're doing um, on behalf of um, our planet and our communities. Also, um, thanks to Sina Cowan and Leslie Anderson from the National Nordic Museum and the museum itself for putting together this series. And most of all, to those of you who have been listening, you can check out the other programs in the series, which you'll find on the National Nordic Museum's YouTube channel or at nordicmuseum.org. Have a great rest of your day and be good to the planet. Thank you. <laughs>